This week, ACK. Remember the comic strip Kathy? Eleven years after it ended, discussion of the strip continues, including on the recent podcast miniseries called ACKcast, in which comedian Jamie Loftus interviews Kathy readers, other cartoonists, and creator Kathy Geiswhite herself about many of the issues raised in the strip. Emmett talks with Jamie in this episode. First, if you're enjoying this podcast, we'd love it if you'd support the show at patreon.com slash deconcomics for as little as $2 a month. All patrons get our bi-weekly videos featuring 20th Century TV trivia quizzes, more perks and bonus content at higher donation levels, including discussions of MCU movies and Lee Ditko Spider-Man stories. Help us meet our goals to unlock the earliest episodes of our podcast and put them all back in the feed. Pledge your support now at patreon.com slash deconcomics. This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Hello and welcome to another episode of Deconstructing Comics. This is Emma Kuna in country Victoria, still under siege from wild kangaroos with a peculiar grudge against me. Don't know why. And this episode, we're talking about a podcast. In fact, we're interviewing the host of a podcast about a comic book series. Comic strip, rather. I am on the line with uh, Jamie Loftus, comedian, writer, uh, podcaster behind the Bechdel cast, another uh, comics reference there and Lolita <laughs> podcast and she recently released and you can now listen to the full series ACK cast I can't quite do it ACK cast um you which, nailed it. Uh, which is all about Kathy um Kathy Geisweit's uh strip um thank you for joining us Jamie oh thanks for having me I'm excited yeah this is um this is exciting for me too because I meant to check with you if I could do this before we start recording, but I absolutely loved uh, Lolita podcast. I thought you did an incredible job. Um, oh, it was, thank you so it was, much. It was so direct and you just, just on his face, there was no bullshit. There was no ironic posturing, which I think a lot of content around Lolita tends to be or distracting. Sure. You just got straight to the point. And um as I was listening to the podcast, I kept flashing to this memory of being on a bus reading Lolita as a as a teenager, I think late teenager, and just feeling mortified, like absolutely disgusted with myself when I was reading this book. Um, mm-hmm. But it was one of the great books, so you're supposed to read it, you know? Um, yeah. And I felt like you cut through all of that, and I thought it was a fantastic lesson. So uh, when I heard you were doing another series uh, on Kathy which mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with at all. My, my, my key reference point for Kathy is um, a bit in 30 Rock, which you feature in the first episode yes. of your show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I remember that very clearly when it, like, I think maybe when that first aired or definitely when I first saw it. And uh, it's, it's, it's sort of both, I think, is affectionate, but at the same time mocking. And what I'm interested in is how you are supposed to celebrating the Kathy strip in this, but you also have a lot of critique in there. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm fascinated that I can't think of another cartoonist who would be so willing to participate in that critique with you or with anybody. Um, Kathy Geiswhite appears on your podcast and she seems to take a lot of the criticism on board, which I feel defensive towards her over. <laughs> I don't. But, yeah. Um, She's she's um, she's open to it at the same time, which is interesting. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, I, I felt so um, lucky, and I was. I mean, when I like pitched this show, I was pleasantly surprised that she was even open to to doing it at all because I wouldn't have really. I, I feel like it wouldn't have been the same without her. So I, I was really happy that that she ended up sort of deciding to to give me a shot with this yeah. show. Yeah, uh, you read over. Uh, 1,200 Kathy comics as research. Um, the yeah, pod- every single one. <laughs> the podcast features uh, your narration. It features performers uh, acting as the characters from Kathy. Um, 
you have interviews with Kathy Garswright herself. And uh, for me, one, one of the most emotionally engaging bits of the podcast is you featuring interviews with people who were in the workplace, women in the workplace during the period that Kathy was being serialized. So you're talking about the issues of Kathy uh, with these people who actually experienced a lot of these issues and mm-hmm. that you know, incredible stuff. And then of course, as we mentioned before we started recording, you interviewed 12 artists, 12 comic artists and comic creators um, today mm-hmm. who potentially you could tie back in some way to Kathy or who have been influenced by Kathy or you know, just the state of the world today. Um, mm-hmm. It's a very interesting show. And um, I, I'm just, I just wanted to give you a platform to talk about it because I, I really love it. Also, the theme song slaps. <laughs> Isn't it so good? Oh, my gosh. I can only take credit for the, the lyrics. But yeah, Brad Dickert, absolutely. Like, he did it. He also did the theme song for Lolita Podcast. And mm. he, like, has never done a second draft for me. He just is, like, so unbelievably talented. <laughs> It's fantastic stuff, yeah. um, and and I forgot, to, yeah. I, I forgot to mention you even introduced this idea of Kathy herself uh, as a sort of sleep paralysis demon, your your sort of bad conscience just creeping into the show, which I thought was an interesting touch. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I wanted to give the character a chance to semi defend mm. herself, um, and that was that was kind of his quote. And we already had. Uh, Jackie Johnson, who's like such a, a talented um, voice artist. And I was like, well, I'll just talk with Jackie. Like, that's mm. perfect. Mm. Oh, it's very cool. So you open the podcast with a reflection on how, again, there was this research of interest in Kathy and, and you frame it as like a picture was shared on social media. Kathy guys who had, oh my God, oh my God she's actually physically attractive. Um, so again, there's this notion of, having to stick up for Kathy and stick up for Kathy Guys White because like she's consigned to some sense of being a um, fully uh woman in the workplace. And mm. you know, there, there was actually a, a person behind that comic and this person who didn't particularly want the comic to be named after her because she knew, I think she knew early on there would be that association. It would be she would have to carry this character. Right. So was, was that the point of inspiration for you? That 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 sort of viral discussion around Kathy or have you, is this something that's been ticking on the back of your head for a while? Yeah, that was, I mean, it, it was something that I, I don't, I don't know like what it is. I know that, I don't know. I feel like this phenomenon exists for a lot of different things, but some viral, viral tweets are just like cyclical where I remember seeing someone went viral with that, like what Kathy guys, what is hot? I'm mad. Or like what? I don't know. Like, that I, I remember seeing that a couple years ago and I went back to like verify that this had this thought had gone viral before and then it came back again earlier this year and so I don't know I mean it, it's like very much in my wheelhouse of like why are people like why why be mad about that uh, mm. which is a lot of stuff on Twitter this is like the lower end of consequence but um yeah, once I saw that it had also had this resurgence, so it was just like this sticky criticism that wasn't even really criticizing anything, really. Like, it, it's not saying anything. It's just being like, look at this, and then everyone gets mad about it. And so I, um, I was looking for a topic to do a show on after finishing uh, Lolita podcast, which you mentioned, and I wanted to choose less heavy material and this tweet kind of came up in my feed and I like sort of traced the thought back and my mom was really into the comics when I was growing up and it just sort of seemed like um the right fit so I I you know sort of told the network that I work for like you know, if she would be interested in participating, because she's she had done some interviews in the past couple of years, mm. like if she'd be interested in particip- participating, then I'll like you know go all the way with it and, and see see what's there. And, and just as well, uh, just quickly to note, your interviews with Kathy Geiswhite herself, there's a warmth mm-hmm. there 
which was unexpected. It's not a formal interview. It comes across really like you're just having a conversation, which I thought was a nice feature of the podcast as well. You know, <laughs> oh, I I was like so thrilled that she was she what because that's just like what she's like. It was mm. so nice to I don't know. It it made me like I feel like it's like a setting a standard for like being open to discussing your own work and like just mm. I don't know I she's she's so wonderful and she did um she did vet me before agreeing to do it like it took um a little bit of time which I understand I'm I I had to keep reminding myself I'm like this is like her life who is going to agree to do something if it seems like I'm going to spend you know 12 hours shitting all over her life <laughs> you know um so so we we talked we had talked on the phone a couple of times by the time we actually recorded an interview mm. and so and she's just i don't know she's just so nice and like genuinely like would ask me about myself and mm. wanted to i don't know she yeah she's so open to engaging with any thoughts that people have on it and has kind of heard everything at this point so it was like it was really fun to to she was just like so generous with her with her time and um being game i'm like i don't know if i would be this game if the situation was reversed mm. yeah and and there's an openness there as you say yeah and it's it's yeah quite broad and and again because you, you just said that you chose this topic because you wanted um less let's say um difficult material to work with than lolita podcast uh, but at yeah. the same time kathy becomes this prism to discuss the history of feminism, to discuss body issues, to discuss anxiety, to discuss boomerism, <laughs> as you pointed out. Yeah. Um, it, so much it got, is packed in here. It got hard. It got hard. I was really hoping that it would be, I think that this was, I mean, I don't know. The, the formats are similar, but the, it was two very different experiences making both of those shows. But in some ways, yeah, doing act cast was like, harder in terms of just like I sort of thought oh I'm mostly gonna just be reading comics mm -hmm. but then once I read all the comics I'm like oh my god I have to read like 12 more books before I can even start you know like it just became like this huge uh time-wise uh, uh, undertaking to feel like I could get a fuller picture because I wanted to you know like read um, other comic collections that were successful at that time. And so mm. I read whatever, 30 years worth of Doonesbury or like Doonesbury collections and for better or for worse and the boondocks and like all these um, other comics at the time that were considered to be different and like new to uh, American newspapers. And so it just was, I mean, God, every time I thought I was done, researching there was like 500 other things to do it was it was intense but fun because it's like you're reading comics it's not um not bogging you down there's just a lot of it yeah and and something that occurred to me as well is because kathy guys had stopped the strip in 2010 or ended the strip mm -hmm. um although kathy has returned in uh online form recently yeah uh, but I thought that that was an interesting time for her to stop because I feel as if the a com a comic strip, you need to have the day-to-day -day interaction with the strip. So it's the behavior that would be involved is you'd be buying a newspaper every day. And mm -hmm. in the late 2000s, you know, Facebook is coming down like a hammer on that entire behavior. People aren't necessarily buying newspapers anymore people are maybe staring at their phones all the time um yeah online comics are featured you talk about online comics in the show um so she picked a good time to like exit i feel i think she, i think she got as much out of it as mm -hmm. she could because at the, beyond that point um i've been to events or i've seen newspaper uh, editors like freaking out on stage about facebook <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're losing all their advertisers, you know. Oh um, my god! Yeah. And and the thing about that is, you need that day to day behavior just to understand most comic strips. I find you you need right, there, there's right. these long running things, whereas just in relation to your show, I started reading Kathy, 
um, yeah. which I've never done before. Uh, what mm -hmm. I found interesting was it's succinct. Like it's yes, there's long running storylines and there's characters and there's you know there's themes that emerge, but like I find each strip is pretty set up. You know, execution, punchline, boom, 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 and it's always very dry. And then, yeah, and in and out. Yeah, uh, and like it. I know that's what I think. That's what we understand a lot of comic strips do. But I, in my experience, I find they tend to be narratively um, quite a disjointed experience. If I'm just picking up a newspaper and I turn to the funny pages, you know, this one was different. This is actually yeah. just set up, set up execution delivery each time. And she says she's not a comedian. Which is so wild because yeah, all of her interview appearances and the way that like her joke, I mean, there it's she does it's like a setup to two beats and a punchline mm. every day for 34 years. So I don't, yeah, I don't buy it. I feel like she absolutely is <laughs> a comedian. She's written more jokes than most comedians have, you know? Yeah, yeah, she's I'm, I'm trying to remember the last time I read a newspaper regularly. Um, I, I was in my twenties, and I was reading the Guardian, and the in Ireland, and um, they carried the Perry Bible Fellowship. Uh, oh wow, that's cool! Yeah, and I think that's the last one I ever read because when I was growing up, it was Mandrake and Hagar the Horrible and Doonesbury and um, probably Dilbert, which comes into this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, I may have to make a judgment call. No, I you're right. I had it to like. I was like, I'll do a whole comparative study with Dilbert, and then I was just like, no, I'm no, gonna no. Uh, love myself instead. The way you did it was great because it's just like this sneaking, just dismissal. Just because <laughs> you said <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's for the best, I think. Yeah, you, you used him right out of the conversation. But like, um, I, I, I love that because we're talking about Kathy Garcia's openness to this process um i can't imagine scott adams participating in something oh my like god. this I, I have to imagine it would be completely like i'm sure you could get him on the phone sure. but he would yell at you the whole time <laughs> like i can't oh my god i hadn't even thought of that yeah i mean on, i i ended up kind of deciding against that concept first of all because there just wasn't as much there as i thought there was and mm. second of all i was like i don't really want to ever welcome scott adams to interact with me much less kathy like let's mm. let's just leave him out of it and i uh no regrets mm. but i mean <laughs> you you can look at and i'll dispense with dilbert now myself but you can look at that that strip as a as influenced by kathy in terms of the workplace focus in terms of their day-to-day -day life in terms of you know and um, yeah and i i i think this is the unacknowledged thing about kathy just how much drip down influence it actually had and i think mm -hmm. you've drawn that out not just in terms of um the creators that you feature in the show talking about kathy but also um the discussions with your mother in the podcast as well and 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 you mentioned that she she used posed for a photo beside a kathy cartoon on her i i, I can actually i can absolutely see a workplace breaking down and gender lines between women with Kathy comics and their and their partition and then men with Dilbert comics. I can see that. Like <laughs> right. Yes. Just like a very like newspaper funny binary rule. Yeah. At the yeah. Yeah. I mean it, it was so wild where yeah I had last year I like digitized a ton of my family's old tapes and I, there was like a, a tape of my mom's old office and like there it was, you mm. know, taped to the taped to the filing cabinet or whatever. It was so bizarre. So so is Kathy being a part of your life all this time? Or is this something that you dug up yourself? Or how did you come across the comic in the first place? Uh I re no, I, I remember, I mean, she the strip wasn't like a huge part of my life, but I remember um my dad wrote for a newspaper forever. Mm. So we had newspapers in the house. Um probably longer than most families did. Um, and I always, I did read the Sunday funnies uh, probably up through like the, the, through elementary school maybe. And I remember like the ones I liked and the ones I skipped and then Kathy. And it was so bizarre because when I talked to um, comic artists who were close to my age, it was kind of a similar thing where it was like, 
I would always read Kathy and I didn't understand it, but I like, I really wanted to understand it. Yeah. So I would always like, even though I wasn't really laughing because I didn't really understand, it was like, I don't know, there, there was nothing else like it on the page. And I felt like, especially as like, you know, just seeing like, uh, uh, this strip is about a lady and she's not like lecturing her child, which I mm. feel like is a lot of the characters that you would find. And I would be like, uh, moms suck or, <laughs> But like Kathy was like saying something and I wanted to, I wanted to get it, but I, I, it took a while, uh, to, to get it. I get it now. Mm. Uh, it's like the moment when, uh, it clicked for me that, uh, Gary Trudeau was doing Hunter S. Thompson in Doonesbury, like, because I wouldn't have had yeah, that frame right. of reference. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I read that Hunter S. Thompson sent Gary Trudeau a bag of his own poo. <laughs> Isn't that great? I was like, oh, what a delightful fact. <laughs> I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> right? I was, like, I was like, man, that's like, I mean, I guess maybe not a person that's difficult to get a rise out of, but to go through the trouble of defecating in a bag and mailing it to someone uh, through the USPS is incredible. I love it so much. <laughs> well, we were just talking about the... Um... Australian healthcare system before we started and uh apparently that is something I will eventually have to do because uh they you, they, they test your they test your poo for um for cancer signs of cancer so you have to send it to the oh, post. so you mail so you mail them your poo for science <laughs> in a lunch box or a little second container whoa <laughs> that's Wow, I was, I was you guys really have something going on over there. <laughs> I had a we went we were to a stand up gig a few years ago, and this um, Australian comic he he that was his story. He, he that was his bit. He did a bit about that, and I was like, oh, it's all ahead of me. <laughs> this oh my God, that, um, how thrilling! How thrilling mm. for you! Absolutely. I hope wonderful. you think of Hunter S. Thompson I, as you're going poo poo into that little lunch box. You, you you've helped a lot. That that's definitely the visual I will have, and you know, <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll I'll yell about young people or something while I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get me in the mood. Your fist in the air. Demand someone get off your lawn. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm really into gun rights. Um, yeah. yeah, I've actually um, I've actually just started a new job. Uh, this month and i okay. took advantage of um i mean I, where i'm sitting right now talking to you is where i sit doing my work i find the situation we're in now now we're working from home and lockdown uh, mm -hmm. covid all that kind of stuff i i i want kathy comics about this about how the workplace has invaded our homes um yeah right I, I yeah it, there's a whole thing there um about how you know maybe you just uh turn on your camera for like 10 seconds, 10 minutes or other during the day. And then the rest of the day, you can just walk around your jammies. It doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about appearance anymore. It's the whole thing. Um, yeah. But I, I, I took advantage of uh, yesterday's meeting to ask for a show of hands. I just was curious how many of my colleagues um, had read or were aware of Kathy. Ooh, um, okay. Yeah. So there was about eight in the team and uh -huh. mostly women. And um, only two had heard of it, and one was a dude. Interesting. So, yeah, and and the the woman was younger than me. Um, so I it I, does seem to be pretty relegated to the U.S., which I didn't realize hmm. at first. But then once I once that became clear to me, I'm like, I guess it is like a. I mean, there's a lot of universality in it, but I'm like, there is a lot of like, there's entire months dedicated to like doing American taxes. So I guess that that's, you know, <laughs> the yeah. reach is somewhat limited. I think it was collected. I think it was available as, as trades, as tra um, okay. collected editions. And my, my partner, she, she knows about Kathy. She's read Kathy, um, but mm. I, I hadn't encountered it. Um, and, you know, I, I get annoyed with Australians because I refer to asterisks and they don't know what I'm talking about because they didn't get asterisks <laughs> out here. Uh, right. <laughs> very, very frustrating. That's on um, them. That's that, on them. Absolutely. But um, yeah, I, I was, I was just, I was interested in that. I was interested in the fact that, you know, this, this comic, I think as you, as you've proven with this podcast, it touches on all these issues. And I, I kind of feel like it's something that we should be talking about more. So um, thank you for actually highlighting the fact that it's touching on 
all these teams. How did you, did you just naturally evolve the concept of the podcast from reading Kathy or did you have in mind, I'd like to maybe see how this approaches feminism and body issues and so forth. Was this, which was the car before the horse, which, which came first? <laughs> uh, I knew when I started working on it, that I was going to talk about body issues, diet culture and mm. feminism, because that was like, just from my limited interaction with this strip before that I knew I like I knew that much and that was sort of what I associated with the strip but yeah as uh, I, I didn't make an outline or decide you know order or topics or who even I wanted to interview besides Kathy until I had read through the entire strip so like the first month and a half of working on this show was just like going to the park every day and reading Kathy mm. comics like day after day after day after day. And then once I was through it, I was like, all right, I've read, you know, 34 years worth of this. I feel like I, I understand the things that come up over and over. And also the things that come up over and over that are not a part of the popular legacy that I wasn't aware of and kind of like pared down um, the, the topics from there. Coming up, the pitfalls of naming your comic strip after yourself, and more. Don't forget you can help to unlock classic early episodes of Deconstructing Comics, help me return all the old episodes to this podcast feed, and at the $4 level, get access to hours of additional full-length podcasts. At the $10 level, you can review the book of your choice with me here on this show. Support Deconstructing Comics and our other shows at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Or you can send a one-time donation via PayPal to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. Greetings from Wayne Manor Memoirs, a podcast dedicated to exploring the Batman mythos. Each episode, we research a character, story, contributor, or piece of pop culture related or adjacent to the Dark Knight. And try to understand why these topics are important to the Bat mythos. I'm Joe. I'm Kendall. And some of our favorite topics include the transformation of Mr. Zero into Mr. Freeze. The early appearances of the Riddler. Booster Gold, Commandi, Jim Aparo, and many, many more. Check out Wayne Manor Memoirs every other Friday, wherever you download your podcasts. And follow us at Wayne Manor Memoirs on Facebook or at W Memoirs on Twitter. Until next time, Bat Fanatics, be brave and stay bold. The, the other thing I enjoy is, is how much you hate Irving. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's so off. Like, Kathy still kind of defends him, but then it's like, I'll ask her a follow-up question, and then she's like, well, yeah, he's bad. I'm like, yeah, he's mm. bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, the, the characters being used to represent some of these themes, so Irving's failure upwards... I think it's an interesting uh, idea of the comic that he like he yeah. keeps landing on his feet, even though he seems to be ineffective at most things, including romance. Um, mm-hmm. Trust. Uh, <laughs> um, Andrea introducing discussions of um, feminism into the strip, I think mm-hmm. is an interesting point of, because yeah, you can explore it. That, that, that way you can actually have that conversation. You can, you can raise those issues. And then, as you as you point out, you know, Pinkley, sort of the sexual harassment theme of the comic strip as well, uh, as shown by mm-hmm. Pinkley. I, I I I'm I'm a bit loath to to sort of phrase this because I feel as if people are acting now as if they've just recently discovered sexual harassment is a thing, um, right? Yeah, which I, I I can never get my head around. Um, you know, uh, I I you know we do we didn't discover racism was bad in the in the eighties, but we, we we seem to be behaving now. But some people act like it, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 difficult for me um, because mm-hmm. I I feel as if well that's a that's a reaction to something that was happening, um, but you frame that within uh, in terms of commenting on the strip and how Kathy Guyswell was possibly responding to the Anita Hill 
hearings. Um, yeah. And, and, and then Pinkley's behavior and this whole idea of um, sensitivity training, all this stuff. That, that, that's all here in this comic as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't, I mean, I didn't realize um, how, I don't know. I mean, there, there's, there are some storylines in Kathy that are pulled like directly from things that existed where, which I didn't know until I finished reading the strip and I was going through all my notes and I was like, Oh, like she, you know, spends three weeks on this, like men reclaiming masculinity, like fake summer camp in the early nineties. And then when I did more research, I was like, that was a, that was a thing that, that like happened after the Anita Hill hearings where there were all these kind of, um, I I mean, I guess just kind of like scammers, right. Who are, who are like, you know, all these women are out to get us, which is, you know, kind of what happened a couple of years ago as well. Mm. And they're like, we need to reclaim what's ours and we're all going to, you know, give me $400 and I'll bring you to the woods and point and we'll point at a tree and like, hate everyone like it. And that was like a real popular trend that I had just like never, ever heard of. I assumed that she was making it up, but she wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of aggravating to think about, but um, yeah, yeah. It, this this as you mentioned before with the uh, discussion on Kathy Guys about herself, uh, there's there's a cyclic nature to these things. They keep coming around again, yeah. and 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 then we just repeat the same thing again. Um, right. I really liked the episode you did all about the twelve creators. Oh, I, thanks. When when uh, Humyara Mahub started speaking, my ears pricked up because I, I you know, Australian accent, and uh, I used to yeah. do a podcast all about Australian comics and some co-creators. So I was like, "Who's this? I don't know who this is." Um, and then awesome. I know I, I checked her out, and I noticed mm. that uh, I had actually read some of her stuff before. She did uh, a piece for the ABC here. All yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was familiar with her. I was like, "Oh, yes, I know who that is." Um, but like you, you gave a showcase to all these creators, and I thought that was interesting as well. Just you know, you're having this conversation with Kathy, you're having this conversation about these themes, these broad themes. You can touch to Kathy. Okay, I'm gonna now use this podcast to be a platform for other creators. Um, mm-hmm. That was that was fantastic. How, how did you? Well, how did you go about that? I saw you put a call out for comic artists back in April. Was this part of that process, trying to find people to interview? Yeah, yeah, that was. Um where I mean I had I think that the 12 people I ended up interviewing it was like half people that I knew I wanted to speak with and then I wanted to just crowdsource and and just like learn about mm. new people which is how I uh met Humyara who is like the coolest person mm. on the planet um and was just introduced to a bunch of other artists that I just didn't I, I'd never seen their work before and yeah I mean that that came out of as I was reading Kathy the the like vitriol behind how people talk about it if they know what it is like started to make less and less sense because I was like well this is just like self like this is just semi-autobiographical stuff like that's that's so much of what is popular now and also like was popular when I was getting into web comics and zines and all this stuff it's like that is what those genres usually are so why are we mad that Kathy did it before any Mm. like before a lot of people not she wasn't the first but you know like was doing it decades before the comics that I loved in you know high school and middle school and so I I, I wanted to uh, make that point while also just showing yeah like you're saying just like showing people or hopefully exposing the audience of the podcast to to artists they may not have heard from uh heard of that are you know I tried to find people who are sort of from from a lot of places from a lot of backgrounds at different points in their careers different specialties and it was just yeah it was that that episode was such a blast to put together and then at the end of every interview I would just ask them like what's your connection to Kathy? And sometimes there would be one and sometimes there wouldn't be. Mm. And that I was really, when I was like pulling those clips or when my editor was pulling those clips. Um, yeah. I was like, Oh, it actually, there is a through line of like what people know. And it depends on 
where you grew up and how you mm. grew up and when you grew up and just all this stuff. It was really, it was really fun to put together. Mm. Um, and speaking of, I, I've, I've known a couple of um, Australian comic creators who are lawyers as well. It seems to be a bit of a field there. Um, so really, it, yeah, what the, is that? I, 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 they've got the, I don't know, they've got time or they've got the passion because they've, they're secure enough in their career. They can do comics as well. Um, right. That's what blew my mind about Humyara is like, she has a show on Netflix. She does, she's an incredible comic artist and she's also like still a lawyer. I was like, yeah. how do you do that? That's amazing. <laughs> that's too many skills. If you can partition your life that way, that's fantastic discipline. Um, I know. Yeah. I was like, I would not be able to like, you know, portion off my brain like that. That's that's incredible uh i i could throw another one at you um there's a, a cartoonist a comic creator called nikki greenberg and she mm-hmm. has done a she does a lot of stuff for children now but she did a a collection all about the great gatsby where they're all fish oh, cool. they're all the characters <laughs> of fish so it's underwater nice uh she did a version of hamlet which is a uh they're all like ink blots on a stage. So this is sort of stage performance of Hamlet. And then we go backstage and then there's all these relationships that uh, occurring backstage between the performers setting up. Oh, so it's like a, uh, what is that play? Yeah. That that's, I love that concept. That's so funny. Yeah. So Nikki Greenberg, she's amazing. Um, uh, there's a, a lady called uh, Scarlett Puccini and she's a musician, comic creator, one of my favorite people in the world. Um, she did a thing called Zombolette, which is all about Kathy esque. It's about a, a zombie girl. And uh, love Kathy esque. That's <laughs> her, her, sorry, her beautiful turn of phrase. <laughs> she's she's a zombie um, whose body is decaying, and she's completely shameless about it. She doesn't care. Like uh, <laughs> she cool. just she's got a a pet hamster who uh, she mistreats horribly um very very funny uh she also did a book called jesus reloadeth where jesus and mary come back and kick the shit out of some christian fundamentalists and Mm -hmm. um a comic called bug which is this beautiful very sedate um meditation on a little bug um uh so scarlet puccini if you if you ever if you see anything by her She's just great. And Tricky Walsh, she's from, I believe she's from Tasmania. She did a comic called Hoppers, which is basically Snowpiercer. Before Snowpiercer. I don't think she'd read Trans Personnage, you know, the original French book. I think she just yeah. came up with a bunch of people in the post apocalypse on a train. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just that's just when I when I heard Hamyara, I was like, oh, 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 what other Australians are there? Who, who else? <laughs> What's can I recommend? Oh my gosh, um, I have like a whole list of, of people to check out now. Thank you. Yeah. No, worries, no worries. Um, but the other person I thought of when I was when I was listening to your podcast, um, I read years ago. I read Drinking at the Movies by um, Julia Wertz, uh, which I loved mm-hmm. and really um, hit me where I lived a couple of times. And it also has <laughs> this amazing uh, forward by uh, handwritten forward by Jean Garofalo, which. Uh, has to be has no to kidding be. oh that rocks she can't type she doesn't have a computer <laughs> she oh only my uses, god so she she wrote it she wrote it all down uh, on, on paper and sent it to julia words and um there's like uh, cross out words and and drawings and and digressions and it, it, it it's it's incredible it's really interesting That's to read. so awesome but she uh julia words did a comic in 2009 called the title of the comic was i i fucking love food and <laughs> the caption to the comic was if anyone compares this to some kind of kathy comic i'll fucking kick their dick off <laughs> that's a strong reaction it's uh, she's setting I'd the tone like to have a sit down with her <laughs> um and that made me think of what you were just talking about there, the the discussion with these creators, how much of an influence is Kathy on you, or maybe even how willing are they to be associated with Kathy is possibly the way to put it, you know? Um, are they comfortable mm-hmm. being compared to Kathy? Um, mm-hmm. And that defensiveness, I'll fucking kick their dick off. 
I think it, it speaks right? to, which is yeah. like, it's so, it's so bizarre. And it like comes up, it came up in those interviews where, um, I, Anna Salinas kind of sticks out in my mind of like her, like initial was like, well, my comic is nothing like Kathy. And then she's like, well, it is about depression and body image and mm. food issues. And then she's like, oh, it actually is a lot like it. I just, it's like pushing past that negative association to be like the comic itself. Like there's nothing wrong with being associated with it. But I mean, even in that 30 rock episode that you mentioned, mm. and there's like a sex in the city episode where like Carrie Bradshaw is like resisting association to it when they share a lot of, you know, qualities as well. And it's just, there is, it's just like a knee jerk reaction that's based on not even what they're talking about it's like based on the criticism of what they're talking about mm. that was pretty sexist so it's yeah it's um it's interesting mm. and in your in that episode on the 12 creators you one of the things you highlight is how online comics or zines particular zines gave creators the opportunity to be expressive about their situation um maybe maybe even deal with some of these issues they had in this format, mm-hmm. uh, which they wouldn't have had potentially if they tried to go traditional publishing routes, you know, you you have right. that ability to um, lay out your experience and put it out into the world and get a reaction from the world, sometimes yeah. instantaneously. And th- 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 that was your you, you talk about it as well. That was your you went into scenes because you were sick of the immediate clapback from the internet. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Like the not, not giving someone an instant route to yell at you is Mm. very appealing. Yeah. But but I I feel that that also informs some of the resistance around Kathy, the comic strip, because Kathy Guys White is now being judged as a person by association with the comic strip, which she didn't want. She is drawing on her life, you know, this autobiographical elements, but she's now being judged on the basis of this character and this character's obsession right. with food and all the dating and all the rest of it. Yeah. It's so, it's so bizarre to like being judged personally by satire mm. that you wrote that was like drew from your life. But obviously I don't know. Yeah. the Especially once I started reading it, it was like how for a lot of, for a lot of, the strips i'm like how would someone think this is a one-to-one thing this is so ridiculous Mm. like but but it did seem like i don't know yeah there there was this tendency to assume that that was just like uh something that had happened to her turned up to an 11 which which is totally connected to um that tweet that we were talking about Mm. of like people being so upset or like having a strong reaction, I guess, either way, because some people would just be like, I'm horny, you know, but like <laughs> <laughs> having a, re- a strong reaction to finding out that she didn't look identical to her character. Like, uh, I, I don't know. I I thought it was really funny when um, I, I listened to this interview with Lynn Johnston, who does For Better or For Worse. Mm-hmm. And she was like the, you know, the the other woman writing about women in in that era and i guess kathy called her up and was like just don't let anyone convince you to name it after yourself like do not because it really like i mean even now whatever with these like bizarro tweets it still is kind of haunting her legacy you know whether Mm. she's on twitter to see it or not i do kind of love i think it was that article was it the article in the cut I think you you cited yes, it as Rachel well. Rachel Symes piece. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, where she mentions that Kathy Geisler has like a shrine to Kathy in her home. I kind of yes. love that. I love that as a sort of owning it, this situation. Yeah. It's awesome. It's yeah. the coolest. Uh, it's the coolest room I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, sorry. So you 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 met her in person. This wasn't the um, over over Teams type situation or over Zoom type situation. You actually got to. Hang out with Kathy Gasso in person. Uh, it was it was a little bit of both. It was like ah. the uh, we were in lockdown for all the interviews that are mm. recorded for the show were done over Zoom. But I I did get to go and went, you know went over to her house, saw the shrine, 
talk to her and like spend an afternoon with her. And it was like the best. She's great. I'm extremely biased because I like her a lot. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I mentioned at the start that you did the Bechdel cast and uh, I love the show. You and Caitlin Durante do. And it's a you're reviewing movies within a feminist lens. And what I like, I also like that you make a point of crediting Alison Bechdel each time each episode you do your yeah. intro and you, you make sure uh, so it doesn't be just become meaningless phrase, you know, the Bechdel test. Um, right. You're saying, no, no, this is, and then you have your own take on the Bechdel test as well. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, uh, I had a more defining experience where I saw Alice Bechdel in Adelaide at an event at writers Whoa. event, writers festival. And um, someone I know actually interviewed her and apparently didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the audience. I asked a really long, boring question. Um, <laughs> fell flat in my face. Um, but there was a gent there as well. Love it. Young guy asked her the question. I'm going to bring this back to Kathy now. You said, so Alex and Bethel, in her talk, you said the personal is political. What does that mean? And mm -hmm. there's this expression of just like, what in her face? <laughs> I think it's commonly known, but it's interesting that this guy, who's clearly of a generation, he just hadn't heard of it before. He hadn't heard the phrase. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, what you've established with this podcast. You've actually established how Kathy does make the personal political. Like there is this through line um, of how the events in this comic strip, which I think a lot of people have mocked and maybe why is because they touch home a little too much um it a lot of right, it is right it relates to your it relates to sexual politics it relates to your financial viability your your economic status uh your political status whether or not you can actually operate within the world comfortably like these are all things that comic touches on um mm -hmm. but you drew them out and uh i think Anyone who's written off Kathy, they should listen to Akcast because I'm not going to do it again. I feel like you, <laughs> that was great. You, you, you've you've established all of it. Um, up to and including Kathy Geisert herself, she makes some comment to. I don't know. I can't remember if this is in in a discussion with you or this is from an interview. She talks mm -hmm. about how important it was for her to work on each strip, to produce every strip, not to do reruns, as it were. Um, that mm -hmm. she had to earn her spot on newspaper page, the funniest page, and she was going to leave it to somebody else who would work as hard as she would. Um, yeah, I, I that I feel like almost like she saw it as stewardship or something. She saw it as you know this really important thing to be carrying. I don't know. Yeah. What's your impression of that? What's your impression of her uh, uh, I... view of the comic? I really loved that. I, I mean, yeah, that was something that really stuck with me. I think that was, it, it, she was, she did a whole whatever round of interviews when she was ending the comic and everyone was asking her like, why? Mm. Because for her, I mean, it's, I don't really, I don't really know the, the numbers are kind of all over the place and inflation, all of that, but it's like, she could have made a ton of money by doing nothing. You know, you could still end the comic and continue to, get residuals for as long as there's published newspaper comics. But I thought it was like, I don't know. I was like, Oh, that's so like, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like that was like a choice of hers that was like, Oh, more based in craft than mm. in business, which most people don't go for. And I don't even mean that as a criticism. Cause it's not like Kathy didn't cash in on her character. She definitely did, but you know, it's like certainly the Charles Schultz estate went a different way with that. Yeah. Um, and and it's I, I just thought it was such an interesting way to to say, like, you know what, I've had my time and I want to release this space mm. to whoever else. I thought that was really cool. And I don't know, I, I love that kind of continuity of like choosing to let another artist uh have an opportunity versus make money you don't really need for yourself mm. yeah she, it continued to be labor intensive up until the very end well she was still yeah and it's working away it was so 
it was so bizarre. Like when I was going through like old newspaper archives, just like looking for mentions of her name and trying to find stories that were connected to her from over the years of like little things that would like, there was a whole opinion column that was um, written because when, when Kathy took like, I think it was like a couple of weeks, maybe just a week for maternity leave when she adopted her baby, she like sent a, a handwritten apology to every single mm. newspaper, like, like hundreds of handwritten apologies saying like, Hey, I'm sorry that there's not going to be new strips this week. Please be patient with me. I have an infant. I just want to spend some time with her. And the, the editorial writer who I totally agreed with was like, that's wild because Gary Trudell obviously hasn't been on maternity leave, but he'll disappear for months and years at a time with, with no, you know, he's just, he's just like, I'll be back when I'm back. And mm. that, I feel like that is, so. I mean, that's having met and spoken with her quite a bit. That's very like specifically Kathy guy's way, but I feel like it also connects to how it seemed like she was kind of constantly reminded that it was like, you know, you are one of the first women to hold a space like this, doing this kind of material, like don't screw up or like feeling self-conscious of yeah. if, if she oversteps or she, she takes too many liberties or whatever it is that, you know, her, she personally will suffer as a result and potentially other women who want to make mm. these kinds of comics will suffer. So it was just, yeah. Like even just hearing how she conducted herself professionally throughout like the run of the strip. It's like, Oh my God, mm. the, the stakes were, were, were different for her. Mm. Yeah. And again, that made me think of her um, willingness to engage with you in this podcast as well, her openness to it. Um, and you talk about how she's, carried a lot of the criticism she has received even from within feminist circles as well, where she's going, why I don't like she's, she's, she takes that criticism on board. She's not just rejecting it out of hand. Like I think she's constantly self-reflecting bit of auto critique going on. Yeah. So like, that's a lot of responsibility. She seems yeah. to be carrying for a comic strip. It is, I know. <laughs> I, and, it, and it's, I, I find it pretty incredible that she's like willing to, Mm. or able to, to kind of take that on. But like she does, I mean, I think it also does connect to the fact that like her daughter is my age. And so she was, you know, directly interacting with her daughter's views on feminism as they were, you know, growing and changing and having like the public opinion of your work be kind of uh, not included in like the wave of feminism that your daughter's growing up in and just all this stuff you know I, I wouldn't have been surprised back when I didn't know anything about Kathy Guys White if she was just like inclined to be like shut like whatever I, I got my money I had a very successful comic strip shut mm -hmm. up but like <laughs> it really like she's written essays about it like it really like hurt her and bothered her because she felt that she was or she was really trying to contribute and that a lot of the time those efforts were rejected and it, that's not to say that all the criticism of the comic strip is wrong there's definitely like many many valid points that have been made but um yeah I don't know it, it just feels like a new I'm sure I mean plenty of creators are like hurt when their work isn't received the way they want it to be but I feel like it's very rare to actually admit that and mm. she's she's like very comfortable talking about it mm. yeah no it's very it's very striking um uh I I'm, I'm conscious that I I've probably run on a little too long here I I just wanted to say I think you did an excellent job with this podcast I think it's incredible and uh, you've made me a Kathy fan so thanks for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay mission accomplished <laughs> um if folks uh where where should folks look for you where should folks find your work where would you like to point people to uh well check out act cast it's mm. spelled a-a-c-k um and then you can find basically all of my work i'll, I'll tell you about on social media i'm on twitter and instagram uh twitter is at jamie loftus help and 
I'm uh, working on a book about hot dogs now. So that'll come out in about a year or whenever I finish it. <laughs> I have to find out, find out what these hot dogs are all about. This is... <laughs> There's a lot going on with these hot dogs. (laughs) Wonderful stuff. Um, Jamie, thanks so much. Really, really appreciate it. Fantastic work. And uh, I can't wait to hear the next thing you do. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Look up ACCast wherever you find podcasts. You can help Deconstructing Comics and all our podcasts by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics and go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, to shop on Amazon to support the show, and to find links to subscribe to the podcast. Our theme is by J.B. Anderton. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and we'll critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read it and critique it on the show. On the September 2nd episode of To the Bat Poles, Paul and I talked with comics writer and editor at Ahoy Comics, Tom Pyre, about his series The Wrong Earth and, of course, Batman 66. Look for To the Bat Poles wherever you find podcasts. Next week, I'm joined by listener Colton to discuss the manga Air Gear by a creator known as Oh Great. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics.